good to see each one here this morning, and uh, we want to certainly welcome you. It, it has been a little while since we've been in the book of Acts in God's story in the early church, but we're going back there today. We're going back to the book of Acts, and so if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Acts chapter 19 here in just a moment. This week and next week will be in Acts 19, 20, and 21. And a few months ago, when we were last in God's story in the early church, we looked at Acts chapter 18. I want to just do a, a tiny bit of review. I think we have a map for you just to once again orient you to some of the places that... Uh, uh, do we have the map? We do not have the map. Okay, don't worry about that. Look at it, visualize it in your mind, or look to the back of your Bible and you'll see uh, Corinth and Ephesus. These are the key places that we are uh, focusing on. But in Acts chapter 18, in this particular section of Scripture, Paul was very open about his faith, as he always was. All in, completely committed to both evangelism and discipleship. And in Acts chapter 18... Paul was investing in Priscilla and Aquila. They were growing in their faith, and then Aquila and Priscilla recognized the importance of them helping others, specifically Apollos. So there's this guy named Apollos, and that's exactly what they did with him. Apollos was a gifted man who just needed some direction in his faith. And so Priscilla and Aquila jumped in and helped him. And then Apollos was able to take his gifts and talents and then help other people. He was able to speak truth into the broader city and into the broader region or that community. So here's what you see going on. Review Acts chapter 18. Because Paul was willing to invest in Priscilla and Aquila, and because they were willing to invest in Apollos, God's work was being done. God used Apollos because he was willing to be used, but he also used him because other believers were willing to invest in his life. And they recognized this guy has talents and gifts that can be used for the glory of God, and they wanted to help him make sure that he could use those talents and gifts for God's glory. Now, here's what we got to see, Acts chapter 18. This is discipleship. This is discipleship, taking your faith, passing it along to someone else, helping someone else to understand what God is teaching through His Word. And as Acts chapter 19 now opens up, Apollos had gone to Corinth, Paul had traveled through Galatia and Phrygia, and Paul was now in Ephesus. This is where we begin in Acts chapter 19. When Paul got there to Ephesus... He found some more disciples who didn't really fully understand the way of the Lord. And and I'm not going to read the first section. I'm just going to kind of summarize the first section of Acts 19. But when Paul got there to Ephesus, he found this group of uh, believers, if you will, but they didn't fully understand the truth. They had followed the message of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was teaching the message of repentance, but they didn't fully understand the way of Jesus. And so Paul explained it to them, and they then realized, oh, wow, we want to follow, we want to fully follow Jesus. And so then they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, and God did some miraculous things through them at this time. This is the beginning of Acts chapter 19. Well, Paul kept on preaching and teaching Jesus. He entered into the synagogue, and he did not hold anything back. I mean, would we expect anything different? Of him than that. Anywhere Paul went, he was speaking the truth, preaching the truth. And so here he was, he's proclaiming Jesus. And as was usual in that day, and it's pretty much the same today, didn't sit well with everybody. As a matter of fact, if you look at the text, Paul's teaching about Jesus was publicly maligned. The leaders didn't like it. And so Paul left the synagogue, and instead he went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, where he kept on teaching and preaching Jesus to both Jews and Greeks. He did this for a span of two years. And the text says that all the Jews and all the Greeks who lived in the province heard the word of the Lord. That's verse 10. 
Well, Paul's ministry was also validated in another way as God empowered him to do some miracles, including casting out demons. And that prompted some other people to try to do this themselves, but it didn't work out so well for them. And actually, their failure to be able to cast out demons pointed people back to the one true and living God, the God that Paul was representing. And so what you see going on here in the middle of Acts chapter 19, people came confessing their evil deeds. As a matter of fact, those who had practiced sorcery brought their magic scrolls and they burned them. Even though these things were worth a lot of money, they got rid of them. Verse 20, Acts chapter 19, take a look at this. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So this is what's going on. Acts 18, now Acts 19. God was at work. The journey was not easy. The Apostle Paul was doing what God had called him to do. He understood that there were challenges at every turn. Everything he did, he was going to face opposition. And even as the work of the Lord was going forth, the enemy was doing everything that he could to counteract God's work. And so what you see here, at this point, Paul was planning a trip to Jerusalem and eventually to Rome, but while he stayed in Ephesus for a while, he went ahead and sent ahead of him Timothy and Erastus. Now we're going to pick up in verse 23 and we're going to look at the rest of the chapter as the primary focus text for this morning. So look at verse 23. About that time... There arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together, along with the workmen in related trades, and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There's danger that not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now, let's stop right here. What you see here in Acts chapter 19 is a clash between the gospel and the culture, a clash between the gospel and the culture. Verse 23, what does it say? There arose a great disturbance about the way. Well, what was the way? The way was the way of Jesus, okay? So there arose a great disturbance about the way of Jesus. Well, why was there a disturbance? Verse 24, because this place was well known for its worship of false gods. Here, Artemis is mentioned. Now, the Roman name for this same goddess was Diana. And Demetrius, the silversmith, says, we make a living on people buying silver shrines to Artemis. Now, of course, later on, verse 27, Demetrius adds some other arguments to the point that he was making. He says, well, our trade, what was his trade? Making idols, making shrines to idols. He says, our trade will lose its good name. He also says, the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. He also says, the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout Asia will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now, here's what we have to understand. Because if we look at this, there is definitely a clash between the gospel and the culture. There was a clash here in Acts chapter 19 between the gospel and the culture. And there's a clash today between the gospel and the culture. Matter of fact, anywhere you go in the world, there's a clash between the gospel and the culture. You see it all over the place. And so, but if we look at this text, what was Paul doing? Paul was preaching Jesus, 
He was preaching Jesus as God who died for our sins, then rose from the dead, conquering death and hell and providing us a way of salvation. That's what Paul was doing. And because Paul was proclaiming Jesus as the one true and living God, he was also, as the text says, proclaiming that man-made gods are not gods at all. What are they? They're just pieces of metal, pieces of wood. And the concern was that as Paul kept on preaching Jesus, and many, many people became followers of Jesus, that they would no longer need Artemis, no longer need this goddess Artemis. And as Demetrius brought this to everyone's attention, I want you to look at how the people responded. Look at verse 28. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great! is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours. I mean, when the people realized what Demetrius was saying, when they realized what was happening, it turned into a frenzy. And the people started thinking. They started thinking about lost income. They started thinking about this guy from another place making their God look bad. So they began shouting in anger, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. In essence, they were saying, don't mess with our culture. Don't mess with our culture. This was a clash between Jesus and the gospel on one hand and the culture and false gods on the other hand. And it was such a clash, you can see it right here in the text, it was such a clash that they seized Paul's traveling companions and Paul's friends who were officials in the province told him to stay away from the theater because it was too dangerous. You see, what Paul was saying, what Paul was saying about Jesus was undercutting the heart of their culture. And the people, when the people were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, that was a way that they expressed devotion to their God. That's what they were saying. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when Demetrius said that Artemis uh, was worshipped throughout the world, there was quite a bit of truth to that. I mean, historically, this is what we found. Apparently, there were cult centers dedicated to Artemis in at least 33 different places in the Mediterranean world. Artemis was very famous in the ancient world. And her temple in Ephesus was listed as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was 400 plus feet long. It was 200 plus feet wide. It had 127 white marble columns that rose over 60 feet in the air that were separated about four feet apart each column. The temple was decorated with great sculptures. And in the inner sanctuary of this temple was this image of Artemis. Her powers were supposedly linked to fertility and childbirth. And this image of Artemis that verse 35 says supposedly fell from heaven, many think was a meteorite that either resembled or was fashioned into a distorted image of a woman. 
Not only was this temple an incredible architectural feat and a place of false worship, but it was also a major treasury. It was a bank, if you will, if you will. A, a major treasury for the ancient world where merchants, kings, sometimes even entire cities would place their deposits of money, believing that their money would be safe under the protection of the goddess Artemis. So when Paul was preaching Jesus, he was striking a major nerve in this culture, a major nerve. And he was not only doing something that could hurt the craftsmen and hurt the workers financially, but he was also undermining their historical false religious beliefs. And indirectly, he was attacking their civic pride. They saw this as a wonderful, beautiful accomplishment in their city. And so, when we look at the text, we see the people had invested much in this, and it was a frenzy. Even when Alexander, who's mentioned in the text, he was a Jewish guy that just happened to be the one that they pushed to the front... And, and, and we don't know exactly what was going on here. But even that, it didn't do anything to stop the crowd. We don't know exactly why the Jews pushed him forward. It, it was either to make a distinction between the Jews and the Christians and to say, hey, we're not like them. Or it was possibly to further accuse the Christians and say, you know, yeah, these guys are really bad. Either way, it didn't work because the crowd didn't care. Why didn't they care? Because they also knew that the Jews didn't worship Artemis. And so even if the Jews and the Christians were on a different page, they didn't care at all about this, and they weren't going to listen at all to anything that a Jew said at this point. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what does the text say? They kept on shouting. They kept on shouting for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. In essence, they were saying for two hours straight, don't mess with our culture, don't mess with our culture, don't mess with our culture, don't mess with our culture. Finally, finally, finally the city clerk is able to get the crowd to quiet down. Look at verse 35. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. <clears throat> After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. Now, finally, after two hours of this, finally the city clerk was able to get them to quiet down, to stop shouting and think about what they were doing. And in essence, I think the thing that got them to finally quiet down was him saying, do you really want to be charged with rioting? And what the clerk was reminding them was, uh, was this fact, that Rome did not like to hear about uprisings or riots taking place in their provinces. They expected people within their provinces to live at peace, and if they did, Rome would leave them somewhat alone. But if they kept on having these uprisings, if they kept on having these riots, then Rome would have to step in, and the relative freedom that the people enjoyed in Ephesus would be somewhat taken away. And he's saying, do you really want that to happen? I mean, we got it pretty good here. And so the message got through, the people dispersed, and God's servants, Paul, 
Gaius, Aristarchus, were once again spared, at least for this time. But there's something else here. There's something else here that I think is very important for us to see. The city clerk points out that these guys, Paul, Gaius, Aristarchus, never really said anything about Artemis. I want to unpack this for just a few minutes. Note verse 37. They didn't blaspheme our goddess, the city clerk says. They didn't rob the temple of Artemis. See, that that verse makes sense knowing that there would have been a lot of money there. They didn't rob the temple. They really didn't do anything related to Artemis. What did they do? They preached Jesus. They preached Jesus. And by preaching Jesus, people started finding the truth. And when you find the truth, it causes you to turn away from false gods. And this is what was going on. One commentator put it this way. The opposition of Demetrius and the other idol makers was a great complement to the effectiveness of Paul's work in the region. Paul was not on a campaign to close down the temple. He just did the Lord's work. And as people came to Jesus, they naturally stopped worshiping Artemis and stopped buying shrines associated with the temple. Paul had not blasphemed the goddess. Paul was on a pro-Jesus campaign more than an anti-everything-else campaign. And that's what you see going on here. Here's the point. Here's the point. As we think about today, as we think about the gospel that we have been given by God, I mean, we have it right in front of us in his word. When we think about the gospel and then we think about our culture, you know what? We can see that they are not very compatible. There are a lot of disconnects between the gospel and the culture that we find ourselves in today, just like there were a lot of disconnects between the gospel and the culture that Paul found himself in when this was written. But here's the point. As we think about the gospel today and the culture that we live in, Christians are known for being against a lot of things. We're known for being against a lot of things. And in some ways, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that people know we stand against sin. But in other ways... That's a bad thing because maybe our focus has been too much on what we're against rather than on what we're for. What am I saying? Living as Christians in a culture that is largely non-Christian is very challenging. It's very challenging. But our focus as Christians, our focus as the church, should be on preaching Jesus, Him crucified, Him buried, Him resurrected, risen again, ascended back into heaven, because it is only when a person comes to know Jesus personally that they can then begin to understand why we have to let go of these other things. And you know what? You follow the Apostle Paul around, and you will find that everywhere he went, his focus was on Jesus. Everywhere he went. And when people come to Jesus, the transformation process begins, and people begin to recognize, because the Holy Spirit begins to bring conviction, people begin to recognize, i got to let go of the other gods. Charles Spurgeon, well over a hundred years ago, said this. He says, I wish the gospel would affect the trade of London. I wish it might. There are some trades that need affecting, that need to be cut a little shorter, but not by an act of parliament. Let acts of parliament leave us alone, but it may come to an end By the spread of the gospel. 
And then he said this, I have no faith in any reformation that does not come through men's hearts being changed. In other words, in other words, if we want to see a false God silenced, or if we want to see a dent in covetousness or greed or lust or selfishness or any other thing that you can think of that's not good, it won't be because we pass another law against those things. It will only happen when people fall in love with Jesus and their lives begin to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what has to happen. And so as I think about our responsibility, we have been entrusted with the gospel. As I think about our responsibility with the gospel in this culture, Sure, absolutely as a Christian, I should speak out against the ills of abortion. And as a Christian, I should speak out and and do what I can to stop human trafficking and all kinds of other horrible things that exist that are happening within our society. But if we follow the example, what we see here in the Apostle Paul, we must make sure that first and foremost we are preaching Jesus. Here's the thing you got to understand. See, we can expend a lot of energy to stop something like human trafficking. But apart from Jesus, the sex trafficker, as well as the one being trafficked, will end up spending eternity separated from God forever in a place called hell. And so I believe that the very best way to put a dent in the ungodly cultural norms that are all around us is to first and foremost teach, preach, and live Jesus. There is salvation in no other name other than Jesus. We know that. And when you follow the Apostle Paul, everywhere he went, he stayed focused on the main thing, Jesus Christ dying for our sins, buried, risen again, ascended back into heaven, all so that you and I and anybody you know can be rescued from our own sin. And we are all broken Every single one of us broken. The only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that a Christian is now covered with the righteousness of Christ. It's not anything that I've done. It's only what he has done and that I've accepted this free gift that he's given to me. And so, I am not saying that as Christians we should forget about and avoid all of the hot-button issues. I am not saying that we should stop speaking out against sin. But what I am saying is that the main thing that we should be saying, that the very loudest voice with our teaching, with our preaching, with our lives should be Jesus and how He has transformed our lives, what He is doing in us and through us, and that's how a society can be changed. He is the only answer to the hurts and the disconnects of our culture, the only answer. And we are not going to change our culture by passing another law. But the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ can transform a life even in the midst of a non-Christian culture. When that gets proclaimed, When that gets proclaimed day after day and people are responding, the whole culture can be affected. And that is exactly what we see here in Acts chapter 19. That is what Paul was doing, and that's why Demetrius was so afraid. Because he's looking at, at, at this, and he's realizing Paul, by preaching Jesus, is making a dent in our business. So I ask you, I ask myself, how are, we, how are we engaging our culture? What are we doing? Our most effective method will not be to tell the culture everything that's wrong with it. Our most effective method will be to boldly proclaim Jesus, how he has changed us, and how he can bring peace and joy and contentment into our hearts.
And he can do that like no other God can. And so if we look at this text, Acts 19, God was at work. People's lives were being transformed. But anywhere God is at work, you can be sure that Satan will work extra hard to destroy God's work. This is quite possibly, I hadn't really thought about this until I studied this passage and then was just looking at some different commentaries and and really researching and digging into it. But this is quite possibly why Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, spent a whole section talking about spiritual warfare and putting on the armor of God. Our battle is not against each other. It is against spiritual wickedness all over the place that is directed by Satan. And so, as we promote Jesus in a non-Christian culture, We've been entrusted with the gospel. We have the good news of Jesus Christ. We live in a culture that is non-Christian. As we promote Jesus in a non-Christian culture, you can expect opposition. And so what should we do? Continue on. Continue on. Continue on. Pray. Put on the armor of God. And then teach, preach, and live Jesus And watch what God will do because he is in the business of transforming lives. 